Hi, I'm Dr. Stefana Pescher, the Country Doc. Welcome to our second edition of High Stakes. We have a wonderful guest today that we would like to introduce you to. But first of all, let me introduce our excellent panelists. We have Julie Banks, who is an EFT practitioner and holistic health coach. And we also have Melissa Bouchard, who is a senior cannabis consultant. Today, we'd like to welcome Susan Mien, our wonderful guest who drove all the way from Maine to spend some time with us. Um, Susan, let me tell you a little bit about her. So she's a co-founder of the Maine Children for Cannabis Therapy, which is a volunteer group. She also is currently serving as the secretary for the national nonprofit Parents for Pot. And Susan has quite a story that she would like to share with us. We're very honored by this. And I'm going to let her take it away. And then afterwards, we're going to have some questions that are going to tie into the theme of this show. So welcome, everyone. And please welcome Susan Mean. Thank you. Um, let's see. I am a mom. I have four children. And my youngest daughter, Cindy May, is, is what brought me to this path. Cindy Mae was born in the year 2002. She was born a full-term, normal, healthy infant. And she, at the age of 10 months, was starting to walk, starting to babble, starting to move from crawling to walking, holding on to furniture and holding on to people. And she, because I had to return to work after home for six years, she had a set of vaccinations. It was her first set that was administered all, all together instead of administered one vaccine at a time. And 27 hours after these vaccinations, we noticed what I thought was a seizure. At the time, I was a volunteer emergency medical technician, and I saw what I thought was a seizure when I was getting her out of her car seat. Her eyes were roving back and forth. I, her breathing was fast, and she didn't seem to respond to me when I was talking to her. So I called the pediatrician's office. I, I asked, you know, could this be from the vaccines? Is this normal? Um, I, it looks like a seizure to me. And the doctor's office, this was a Friday afternoon, the doctor's office told me, you know, just keep an eye on her over the weekend. It's, it's probably nothing. And it probably was just REM sleep and she should be fine. So mm -hmm. the next time that this happened, the next time that she appeared to be having a seizure, she was sitting in her high chair eating dinner and she dropped her head to her chest and her eyes started roving like I'd seen in the car seat. And I was certain that it wasn't REM sleep at that time. And that was the, the first 24 hours of seizures. They just escalated one on top of another. We called the pediatricians back again. And they said that the neurological team would be, it would be better to wait until Monday to take her to the emergency room because the neurology team would be on staff on Monday and going into a Friday evening, it would just be better if we could manage things at home, give her Tylenol and, and keep her home until Monday. By Saturday afternoon, she was doing this seizing thing nearly continuously. So we brought her to the emergency room in Providence, Rhode Island. And that was the beginning of a nightmare. Um, she tried pharmaceutical after pharmaceutical drug and with every single drug they gave her, another type of seizure developed. So she went from having these seizures that were kind of benign, that didn't involve the typical shaking and tonic-clonic activity of what you would call a grand mal seizure, but she went into a seizure on a drug called trileptol. She went into respiratory arrest. And one of my other children said, you know, mommy, Cindy Mae is not making breath. And that was our, our first episode of respiratory arrest. And I was from a uh, competent EMT. I was taken down to a very panicked mother on the phone telling an operator that my child wasn't breathing and sort of receiving the proverbial slap in the face that you, you need to breathe for her. And um, came back to EMT in that moment and, and did my first of many artificial respirations for my daughter. So that was um, one drug and those type of seizures never really stopped even though we withdrew the drug. And 
uh, year after year, time after time, we tried drug after drug, anti-epileptic drug after anti-epileptic drug. And we never really regained, we never gained control of her seizure. She always had uncontrolled seizures. Her diagnosis went from irretractable epilepsy, possibly infantile spasms, even though she was a little bit old to be diagnosed with infantile spasms. They, they should have started earlier with that diagnosis. Um, to finally, she was diagnosed with Dravet syndrome, and she was in the 20% of Dravet syndrome cases that are diagnosed without the genetic markers for Dravet syndrome. But she had the clinical presentation for Dravet syndrome. She had thousands and thousands of, of seizures, especially in her sleep. Um, at her worst, she had 20 to 40,000 seizure spikes a day that correlated with a myoclonic jerk. And she had anywhere from four to ten generalized tonic-clonic seizures, which the general public might call a grand mal seizure. And she had several partial seizures in which she was aware that she was having a seizure. She would verbalize she was having a seizure. Her eyes would rove back and forth and her respira respirations would become rapid and her heart rate would become escalated. And then she had the most dangerous of her generalized tonic-clonics would end in uh, full respiratory arrest or cardiac arrest. Um, I performed CPR on Cindy Mae four times. The hospital performed CPR on her once, and her father performed CPR on the day of her death. And she fought these seizures, and for 13 years, she passed away on March 13th, 2016, at the age of 13. But prior to that, when we thought we were at the end of our rope and after 23 AEDs and combinations thereof, after three or four specialized diets for epilepsy, after surgery to put a vagal nerve stimulator in her chest that would send a pulse to her brain to intervene and stop a seizure, um, we were losing her. She was losing weight. She was labeled as failure to thrive. She was bound to a wheelchair, and not because she didn't have the physical ability to walk, but she was bound to a wheelchair from the five powerful drugs she was on. She was on a barbiturate, uh, phenobarbital. She was on diazepam or Valium on a regular basis, plus as a rescue medication, she used a rectal version of diastat. And when that didn't work, she was given midazolam or Versed intranasally and she was on primidone and she was on countless supplements because nutritionally she was a disaster. She was drugged so much that she wasn't able to eat enough food to sustain life. And she was down to about 65 pounds. She was very, very frail and very skinny when we talked to our neurologist and he advised us that the only thing he could really recommend is getting her to a place where she could try cannabis or marijuana. And at this time, she was, it was in 2012, and she was 10 years old. And we knew, we started researching as soon as um, cannabis was put into our, our, into our brains. And we started researching, and we found a story from Colorado about a child named Charlotte who was using a cannabis derivative called CBD. And we didn't know much about using cannabis to treat seizures, but we had a friend in the state of Connecticut and we decided before we financially ruined our family that we would try the cannabis with Cindy May and see what the effect was. So we contacted a friend of mine who I knew had an amazing garden in his closet and it was an organic clean garden. He was a trustworthy friend. I knew he wasn't um, poisoning those plants with chemicals and things that I wouldn't want my child to ingest. So he gave us this cannabis flower or bud and the only thing I knew about cannabis was that in high school we smoked it and I didn't know any other way to administer cannabis to a child. So because Cindy Mae was prone to cardiac and respiratory arrest, we had plenty of masks around to administer CPR. And we would take, draw the smoke into our mouth and blow it into Cindy Mae's airway. And we did this with a strain that Jason called Carmelicious. And Cindy Mae nearly instantly went seizure-free. 
Um, it was the only 90 day period in which Cindy Mae would have absolutely no seizures in her entire life. And we kept getting letters from her Connecticut schools and her teachers telling us how wonderful Cindy Mae was doing in school these weeks and that she was blossoming and telling us to keep doing whatever it was we were doing. And we would, we would joke, you know, if they only knew what we were doing. Um, so that was a blissful 90 days. But on about the 45th day of this 90 day stretch, the person who was growing the cannabis for us was arrested and his house was raided and all of the plants were destroyed by the police. And we had about 45 days worth left of medicine. So on day 90, when we ran out, we really, our hands were tied. We didn't want to buy marijuana off the streets and not know where it was coming from, how it was treated, what kind of garden it was grown in, and how many chemicals it had been exposed to. So on day 92, two days after we ran out of cannabis, Cindy Mae went into status seizures and was admitted to Hasbro Children's Hospital. Um, she was uh, transported in the, in the um, rescue from, from Bacchus in Norwich to Rhode Island. Um, she was given so many drugs to stop the seizures that she was requiring support for her airway. And there were very few people on earth that knew what had happened, why she had gone from complete seizure control to out of control seizures overnight. And we knew at that point, one, one thing we knew was that cannabis worked. And two, we knew that we had to get Cindy Mae to a state in which we could legally treat her with cannabis with the support of a doctor and not risk running out of this medicine ever again. So about a month later, we were in Maine. We, we found a relative in Maine that would allow us to live in, in their bed and breakfast and only pay for the utilities there for the winter and figure out what we were going to do long term from there. So we literally tore our family apart at the seams. And Cindy May and two of her sisters came with me to the bed and breakfast in Maine and my senior in high school. Cassandra stayed behind and lived with my cousin in our family home. And my husband kept his job in Rhode Island to support the family. I resigned or retired from a job that I loved at the Mohegan tribe in Connecticut. I left behind a culture that I held dearly to my heart, my Mohegan tribe and my people. And the three of us, the three of them and myself, moved to Maine and went through that first winter together and um, very rapidly the community in Maine stepped up to help us and Dr. Sulak, Dr. Dustin Sulak was her osteopath in Maine and he was her prescribing cannabis doctor and we still worked with Dr. John, Gaitana, John Gaitanis down at Hasbro Children's Hospital in Rhode Island and coordinated her care. And very quickly, we, we found some cannabis strains that would work for her, and we were constantly on the search for CBD. And we finally obtained a strain called ACDC. That's a high CBD strain grown in Maine and across the country at this point. And we tried it with Cindy May, and it made one type of her seizures much worse. Um, her myoclonic seizures, of which she had thousands a day, um, escalated back to an uncontrolled number almost instantly on, on about 10 milligrams of CBD a day from sourced from ACDC. And we tried some other strains and we had some success with higher THC strains. We discontinued the CBD because we, we couldn't keep her, the myoclonic seizures were very dangerous. Even though they were only about a second long, they were a very quick jerk of her torso that would throw her to the ground and, and cause an injury. So we stopped the CBD and we were, we were um, playing around and experimenting with other THC strains under Dr. Sulak's guidance. And 
we talked to some caregivers in other states and even in other countries. There was a caregiver in Australia that helped us, and there was also a caregiver in Michigan, David Mapes, that mentioned THCA, or the acidic form of THC, which is basically what, what the plant grows, and upon applying heat, THC is decarboxylated and converted into THC. But David Mapes strongly suggested that we take that we try a cold extract tincture that would leave the THC as THCA and try administering this to Cindy May in small doses and see if it helped her seizure control. And we did. So we tried several strains. The first two strains did have a positive impact on Cindy May seizure control, but we still felt we could do better. And Dr. Sulak was a little surprised. THCA was not something that um, we typically talked about when we talked about cannabinoids and medicine at that time. This was in 2013. So we kept trying different strains, and we finally tried a strain called Mob Boss that is a cross of ChemDog and Tang Tang. And this strain called Mob Boss, when we extracted to a THCA tincture, nearly instantly Cindy May's myoclonic seizures disappeared. And at that time, until her death, the only time that we saw myoclonic seizures was when she was sick or compromised, um, dehydrated. So it was, it was really a miracle. She had thousands of myoclonic seizures a day until THCA. And THCA was a phenomenal change, game changer for her. Um, we have pictures. We were only a month into our stay in Maine. And for the first time ever, Cindy Mae was allowed to play outside in the snow where the bright white light would often cause seizures and she had no seizures. Um, she was allowed to go sledding down this giant hill at the bed and breakfast and it was the first time I ever let her on a sled alone because this hill was so big she would be down at the bottom of the hill before I could get there on another sled but she wanted to go alone and the temperature changes were another thing that often triggered seizures and she would go from inside to outside in the cold snow and not have a seizure. She discovered her tongue and she discovered she could catch snowflakes on her tongue and this was all like December. This was only a month after we moved to the state of Maine. So it was amazing. And then in May, I think it was in May of that year, Cindy May had a generalized tonic clonic seizure that was long and, and dangerous. She stopped breathing during the seizure and we administered midazolam or Versed intranasally. And the first dose was um, six milligrams and the seizure didn't stop. So our protocol was to call for the ambulance and to administer the second dose. And upon administration of the second dose, Cindy May went into cardiac arrest. So this was the, the fourth time I believe that I performed CPR on Cindy May. And we ended up admitted to the hospital at this point and transferred down to Hasbro Children's Hospital where her neurologist was. And at this time I reached out to caregivers on some of the pediatric cannabis sites on Facebook and I asked, you know, is there any cannabis-based rescue medication that anyone's using with any success? And there were no, no pediatric cases that anyone could offer that I could find. And again, David Mapes from Michigan reached out to me and suggested that maybe I should try, since THCA worked so well for her, maybe I should try a concentrate of THCA, maybe mixed with half THC, and see how that worked. And um, he also mentioned that perhaps bumping that tincture with a little bit of alcohol would help make it absorb faster. And he had, he had mentioned sublingual or under the tongue, and I knew that that would be impossible during Cindy May's seizures. Her jaw often became too rigid, so I knew that I couldn't risk putting anything in her mouth that she could bite off, um, including a syringe. But I came up with the idea of maybe putting it in her gum line and using it what they call a buccal administration between her bottom lip and her teeth in those gums that should be about as vascular as under her tongue. And it was a miracle. We administered it the next time that she had a generalized tonic-clonic seizure. I rubbed it into her gum line. 
and it stopped the seizure in less than 40 seconds, which was phenomenal for Cindy May. She often seized for hours um, out of control until she was drugged to comatose to stop seizures. So um, it did turn out that she was she had an underlying illness and that triggered this episode of uncontrolled seizures. But it led to the discovery of how effective THC could be in treating a seizure. Now, this original tincture was a combination of THCA and THC. But at the time in Maine in 2013, we had no laboratories to test our cannabinoid profile. So the only laboratory that I, that I had access to was actually in Rhode Island. So whenever we had a tincture that we, that we required a test for, we would, we would drive a sample to Rhode Island and have it tested and wait for a couple of weeks for tests. So we were often treating based on how the tincture worked or how somebody else, if we got somebody else to take it, how it affected them. Um, and in one of the most effective rescue medications that we had made, preparations that we had made for Cindy May, we, we found that it was working even faster in less than 20 seconds. It was stopping any breakthrough seizures. And when we had this tincture tested, we discovered that the THCA had actually been converted. It had been heated too long, apparently, and had been converted to THC. So this is how Cindy May became the first known case of, of a child being treated with THC for breakthrough seizures and THC became her rescue medication. Um, the THCA preparations were expensive at the time. It was very um, tedious to make them and it was, she was using a lot of product. She was probably going through about an ounce a week of product. So anywhere that we could save by just making her rescue tincture just THC was, was a welcome trade. Um, so we also discovered after this, we tried making a rescue tincture with a THC from a blended garden and discovered that even though her THCA strain mattered a lot, the rescue tincture, it didn't matter what the THC was derived from pretty much. Um, as long as we got the numbers right and we got the 3% alcohol content, um, the THC strains didn't matter so much and we could stop her seizures very effectively. Um, Cindy May went over, I think, 18 months without using Diastat or Versed. Well, at that point, Versed was put on her allergy list, um, and it was only used one time after that in the hospital at Hasbro. And this might have been in the same incident. The, the details are, are fuzzy, but the doctors didn't believe that it could cause cardiac arrest, and she was seizing out of control, and they gave a nasal dose because they couldn't obtain IV access. And sure enough, they put her in her only hospital witness CPR incident um, in the trauma room at Hasbro. And after that, though, using THC, we never, we never had another, um, another rescue medication-induced CPR incident. And we never had to use diastat or Versed again at home. So uh, Cindy May's story is, is phenomenal. Um, her best seizure control of her daily seizures was obtained with THCA from Mob Boss, and it seemed like strain really mattered for her THCA preparations. She used uh, very little CBD. Toward the last four months of her life, she developed a new seizure type in January of 2016, out of the blue, out of nowhere. Um, this new seizure type didn't respond to THCA. We tried extra doses. We tried more, we tried less, we tried more THC. Um, it didn't seem to respond and it was a seizure that was, that was proven by EG to be a generalized seizure. It was affecting both sides of her brain. And it was basically a very slow controlled, what seemed to be controlled, slow defined head drop. And if you looked very closely or you could observe the rest of her body at this time, at the same time that her head was going down, her feet were coming up and it was sort of becoming a tight ball. Um, her body. So it affected her whole body and affected both sides of her brain. So it was determined to be a, um, a generalized seizure and nothing seemed to be controlling them. So she was admitted to Tufts Floating Children's Hospital at this time because Dr. Gatanis had moved from Hasbro in Providence to Tufts and he had followed her since she was age two. And they tried medication after medication 
um, for Cindy Mae to control these new seizure types that were happening every few minutes. They were not compatible with life. She couldn't, she no longer could eat. She couldn't function. She would be in the middle of coloring a picture and go into this seizure. It was also a seizure that she wasn't aware of. Most of her seizures throughout her life, Cindy Mae knew when they were coming, she had some sort of warning and she would sit down and get herself safe. But this seizure type um, caught her off guard and just happened relentlessly every few minutes. And so every single pharmaceutical drug that they reintroduced to her system was causing us to lose control of her generalized tonic, clonic seizures, which were very rare now on THCA and THC. And we were losing control of her partial seizures that we had virtually eliminated from her wake-up regime. She used to seize for at least an hour every morning on and off in partial seizures. These were returning back on the pharmaceuticals. And no matter how much we adjusted her THCA dosing and her THC dosing, um, we couldn't, it couldn't compete with all the pharmaceuticals that were being reintroduced into her system. So she was in the hospital for 30 days. Every time we tried to go home, she would explode into a generalized tonic-clonic seizure that required so many rescue medications that she would be unresponsive and basically comatose again. So it was... Time after time, we were set to go home and set to take home our seizing child to try different cannabis strains, and time after time, our, our go home was canceled. Um, finally, Dr. Gaetana said, look, you really, we just need to get her back to Maine, and you need to try some different cannabis strains until you can find one that works, because cannabis is the only thing that has ever controlled Cindy May seizures, and it's the only hope we have of getting control of these new seizures. So we took her home on January 30th, and on February 2nd, I took a huge leap of faith with a bottle that had ironically been in my freezer that entire hospital stay, and it was a product, a cannabis strain called Norwegian Moose Lodge Canatonic, and it was bred in the state of Rhode Island. Um, I think Michelle might have something, Melissa might have something to add to this, but um, a friend of mine called Broderick Moose had given me this, this sample and it had been lab tested and we knew its contents. So when I administered it to Cindy May, the reason I was so hesitant is because it was a CBD high product and I knew how badly CBD had exasperated Cindy May's myoclonic seizures when I had used it when we first moved to the state of Maine. So I gave her a ridiculously low dose, which um, again, we had the lab results. So I gave her 0.35 milligrams of this CBD and her head drop seizures stopped. And I figured it had to be a coincidence that was a ridiculously low dose and there was no way it could stop these seizures that we had been plagued with for over 30 days at this point. So I talked to Dr. Laurel Shepard, who was on call for Dr. Sulak's office, and she said, well, maybe it's a coincidence, maybe it's not, try another dose. So about six, four to six hours after the first dose, um, I gave her another dose, the same amount, 0.35 milligrams, and saw no head drops the rest of the day. Um, it did seem to wake her up a little bit, which again, seemed like too low a dose to have any effect at all on her, but the seizures weren't there. And the next morning she woke up and she still didn't have any of these head drop seizures. I talked to Dr. Laurel Shepard again and she said, well, continue. Give her the 0.35 milligrams, give it to her twice a day and see what happens. Um, CBD we knew kept Cindy May awake. So we tried to spread out her dose like at 7 a.m. and not give her afternoon dose until 3 p.m. But try not to give her any CBD in the evening because it tended to keep her awake. So we added that to her 160 milligrams of THCA to her about 40 milligrams of THC and 0.7 milligrams of CBD from what's now known as maize canatonic. And she blossomed. We had back our Cindy Bay and she was eating again. Um, that last 40 days of her life, we went snow tubing, we went bowling, we went ice skating, we went to the movies, um, we went sledding countless times, and we just had an amazing time um, enjoying that we had Cindy May back. And um, my daughter was home from spring break in early March, so she got to see her oldest sister who was home from college for the week. 
we were testifying in in both um, in both Maine and Connecticut. On March 2nd, we testified in Hartford, Connecticut, and Cindy May sat on my lap the whole time and snuggled with me. And uh, we told our story, and we told Connecticut again that they needed to legalize pediatric use of cannabis. And they had seen Cindy May at several other testimonies that we had offered in the state of Connecticut and Hartford, and they had seen a child who had once been bound to a wheelchair walking with her mom and talking with them and answering questions and responding and had gained a healthy weight and, and looked amazing. So they they ended up passing this bill after, not right after, but after our testimony in, on March 2nd. And from Hartford, we had a very long day that day, from Hartford we stopped in Boston on our way home because Cindy May had an appointment, appointment with Dr. Gaitanis. And Dr. Gaitanis um, brought in his entire staff to see Cindy May at what he called baseline. And she was skipping through the halls and balancing on one foot and answering questions. And this was a child they had seen seizing out of control all throughout the month of January, every person on his staff knew her because she was in the hospital for so many days. So they saw Cindy May at baseline that day. And just in the next couple of days, she had an appointment with Dr. Sulak, who said, keep doing what you're doing. This dose of canatonic seems to be miraculous for her. Um, we had tried to raise the dose a little just because even the doctors couldn't believe this ridiculous dose of CBD was making such a big difference. When we raised the dose, we did see one or two myoclonic seizures and we went back down to 0.7 right away and stayed there. And we also saw her pediatrician in the next couple of days. She had lost um, a lot of strength being 30 days in the hospital in January. So we wanted to start some physical therapy and start some strength conditioning and um, make sure everything was in order. She had had several low heart rate incidents when she was in the hospital. So she was also monitored closely at night. At night, she slept on a pulse oximeter. So anytime her heart rate dropped too low or she had a seizure that caused her heart rate to go too low or too high, she, um, her alarms went off and we would wake her up and rouse her, um, and see if she was having a seizure. Um, on March 13th, on March 12th, the morning of March 12th, um, I kissed Cindy May on the head in her sleep and I brought my oldest daughter to Philadelphia back to college and I left her in the care of my husband and it was difficult every time I left Cindy May. I left explicit instructions as to her protocols and her medications. And I started home on the morning of 13th, on the March 13th from Philadelphia before dawn. I remember capturing a picture of the sunrise on my phone. And when I was at the New Hampshire border, I got a call from my house from my second daughter, from Corey, that they couldn't find a pulse on Cindy May. And I told her to have her father put Cindy May on the floor and start CPR. And I told her to hang up as much as I wanted to stay on the line. And I told her to hang up and call 911. And I got home. Um, and I pulled into our driveway and there was no ambulance and there was a police car or two and there was a hearse and Cindy Bay was gone but she went on her own terms in her sleep on her father's chest and she taught us so many lessons And it's important to me to share her story and to keep sharing these lessons and to keep sharing what cannabis did for us because the last two and a half years of Cindy May's life um, brought back our daughter to us. Um, they brought her out of that drug haze and they brought her out of that wheelchair and they brought us a child who was climbing rock walls and swimming in the rapids of Maine and really enjoying life and interacting and telling jokes and running across softball fields. Um, it, was, it was a miracle and that this, this 
herbal supplement, this food supplement, this plant that can be grown in someone's closet or someone's backyard is demonized and prohibited and it shouldn't be this way. It shouldn't be a last resort. It should be a first resort. And I'm adamant that I will see the end of prohibition in my lifetime in honor of my daughter, in honor of Cindy Mae. So that's why I still fight this war. Susan, you're really an inspirational woman. Thank you. And uh, Cindy Mae, too. Both of you are, are heroes in this war. And um, thank you so much for sharing that. It certainly can't be easy to talk about it, you know. No. So um, we would like to extrapolate some of the knowledge, some of the things that you have learned. We'd like to extrapolate that and apply it to this war yes. that we are fighting on opiates, heroin, and other addictive substances that are decimating our communities. Yes. Um, so would you have any insight? I know a lot of the medications that Cindy May was on, and we had talked earlier and yesterday after your excellent lecture at my wellness center, mm -hmm. um, she had been on diazepine, diazepam, different barbiturates and things like that that were very addictive. And she had a hard time, as any patient does, coming off of that stuff. Absolutely. Um, cannabis seems to be one way to make the transition easier and safer. Um, what do you think about that? Yes. Once we discovered how effectively THC worked for Cindy May and that it didn't cause any seizures. Um, there are rumors all over the internet that, that you can't use THC, you have to use CBD, that THC will cause seizures. Mm -hmm. And um, we found that very rapidly to be false. And once we discovered that, it made the withdrawal from phenobarbital, primidone, diazepam, and Versed um, or midazolam so much easier. Um, she was also on a, a drug called senesamide when we moved to Maine, which is not in any of those classes, but it's a very unusual AD that's um, somewhat of a diuretic. And we started using THC as we wean these things, and we wean these things um, under our doctor's guidance, but our doctors would often prescribe a dose cut of, say, 25%, and I found that to be way too high. It made Cindy Mae um, very uncomfortable, agitated, anxious, um, typical drug withdrawal symptoms, and it also caused very dangerous seizures that we were able to stop with THC, but we felt that if we could go slower, what's the rush? So we started cutting at no more than 10% um, in any one cut, and we would cut a benzodiazepine, for example, by 10%, and we would give her more THC anytime there were any indication of withdrawal, discomfort, um, whether it be anxiety, agitation, um, more seizures, we would, we would counter that with about a 12 milligram dose of THC. Um, Cindy May at that time weighed about 65 to 70 pounds. Um, so 12 milligrams wasn't an extraordinarily high dose, but it was, it was effective. So anytime we cut 10%, we would just carefully monitor her situation and we would dose THC whenever it was appropriate. Um, sometime during her, if her seizures didn't stop immediately from the first dose of cannabis that was dosed buccally for a breakthrough seizure, um, we would dose another dose a minute later. And she'd had up to 96 milligrams on occasion and was still awake and coloring and interacting and very hungry. And we also found that whenever we used extra THC, Cindy May had to urinate frequently. So we dreaded any seizures that happened at night because THC actually woke Cindy May up. And we knew that if she had a seizure in the evening, we were going to be up all night because we were going to be treating this. Um, we'd give her the THC and we'd be in the bathroom every hour and we'd have to incur, we'd have to allow her to have these salty snacks when she was raving hungry from the cannabis. And it, THC made it possible to wean those drugs. We were able to wean her off of every single AED that she was on when we moved to the state of Maine. So all five of them. She ended up only on cannabis for her seizures until January of 2016 when she was in the hospital and all of those drugs were reintroduced. 
um, much to mm-hmm. our, there was just, there was nothing else that, that we had that we thought would work. And there was nothing else that the doctors had that they thought would work. And it was just an impossible situation. But cannabis gave us the way to wean those things safely. So um, that, yes, there's no doubt that uh, cannabis is an effective tool for helping people come off of heroin and other mm-hmm. addictive substances. No doubt. It, are you aware of a protocol? I thought perhaps you mentioned that Dr. Sulak had a protocol um, for utilizing cannabis to wean off of opiates, etc. Um, I There are a couple of caregivers in the state of Maine who specialize in, in helping people come off of opiates, whether they're um, still on heroin or on some of the replacements for heroin through a clinic. And... I, I'm not familiar enough with their protocols to, to say exactly what the protocol is, but I know that they use very high doses of THC to alleviate the symptoms of withdrawal as they step down these opiates very slowly. And, um, you know, as a parent of, co- of college-age kids, I have two kids in college right now, I, I'm terrified whenever that prescription is written. Um, my second child just had her wisdom teeth removed this past year, and I was terrified when that prescription was written for Vicodin, for hydrocodone, because I know that, that most of these, these addiction start at the doctor's prescription and that one piece of paper that they get for a very powerful medication. And I wish, I hope that someday we see the day that Cannabis is used instead and first, just like for seizures, cannabis shouldn't be a last resort or a last trial that we turn to something like THC to treat pain that is far less addictive than these opiates that we're prescribing and ruining people's lives with. So um, that's, I think, where I see the connection that I'd like to see cannabis first and not last in so many more cases in the world, not just seizures, not just drug addiction withdrawal, but perhaps avoiding that addiction altogether. Yes, perfect. In our previous episode, the first episode, we talked about trauma being a a trigger for addiction in many cases. And then, you know, a a switch is flipped when they get that first prescription for Percocet or whatever it is. is. And so it's kind of like a multifactorial approach that we need to take. But certainly the cannabis appears to be a, a wonderful and safe alternative. It has to be a lifestyle change, I think, um, when, you, when you're treating true addiction. Um, there is a, a physical addiction, you know, that, I, that I've experienced just from um, medications that I was put on for migraines, but I didn't have the lifestyle and the entire world encompassing thing that, that an addict, say, to heroin has. But I did have that physical addiction to Fioraset and moving to Maine into a legal state opened my eyes to how I was helping my daughter withdraw from these these other drugs that that perhaps I should consider um, trying to withdraw from the Fiora set and it was so easy um, compared to what I suffered through with prescription after prescription of Fiora set went from using it every now and then to every week to every day. Fioraset became a daily medication for me to control migraines because the rebound migraine was as bad as the migraine I just treated four hours prior. So um, using cannabis made it so much easier and I I haven't touched Fioraset in years um, now Hmm. and I'm very happy with that. Um, But I think that when you're talking about addiction to something like heroin, the caregivers that I know in Maine that work with these, um, Dennis, for example, that operates a company called Genesis Farms, um, it's an entire lifestyle change. Um, you can't get in with Dennis unless you're willing to move there, become part of his farm, part of loving these plants as they're growing, and you're growing plants for the next set of victims who are coming in who need help and need to use cannabis to get off of the, these medica- these drugs that are killing them and killing our societies. So um, it's an entire lifestyle change and it's taking them away from that life away from the people who are their connections their drug dealers and and teaching them a new way that this is perhaps a better way and you can maybe be a caregiver next and you can help the next set of people who need help getting away from this life yes that's very true we've heard that several times that helping others gives them purpose and meaning and helps them make that lifestyle change right 
That's very true. Planting the seed. Some comments I can see in your mind, Melissa. Your something's brewing there. Can I tell what do you about have? Canatonic? <laughs> if you want me to, yeah, I have a little backstory uh, to May's Canatonic. Uh, so Susan and I are on the same national organization, Parents okay. for Pot, uh, but we haven't had the pleasure of meeting each other in person uh, until today, actually. Um, but we talk a lot online. That's how a lot of the cannabis community stays connected. We've had to sort of burrow our way through the underground and, and find our way with each other uh, as these states start to listen to us. But uh, long story short, with May's Canatonic, and we didn't realize this till recently, uh, but um, I had actually gotten my hands on Canatonic years ago. I had worked with the cannabis community, and I have a friend, an organic grower here uh, in Rhode Island, actually named Chris. And um, he was growing all these amazing strains and just couldn't get it right. We were phenotype hunting for, for certain strains and just couldn't get it right. And we, we thought we had this great strain and it was working really well for a friend of mine with digestive disorder. And um, one day the plant just, the, the vegetative plant just died. It didn't want to come to life. And he, uh, he was like, that's it. It was just growing like crazy, very, very difficult to grow. And he just, you know couldn't do it any, you know, it was just too much Had work enough. in the garden. And I was like, please, you know, don't throw it away. And um, it's dead, Melissa. And I'm like, <laughs> bring it to me. And now, mind you, I lived in a two-bedroom apartment and with my son and wasn't growing at the time. I uh, had to shut down. And um, I was like, just bring it to me. We'll figure it out. So anyways, he brought it to me in a big orange Home Depot bucket. And I just put it in my window and I just watered it and I just talked to it. And I said, please, just... Stay with me, like, here. And um, I was friends with Moose. CPR. Also, who, yeah, and I didn't, you know, know what I was doing, but the little Italian gram in my heart said, just love it, right? So um, I was friends with Moose, and uh, he had just moved from Connecticut to Rhode Island and was working on starting a grow and had a little tent set up in, in his spare room. And um, I asked, would you be willing to take this and bring it back to, to life and we'll work together and we'll figure out a way and we'll put all our resources and we'll, you know, get the best lights and we'll make it come to life. So um, he gladly accepted. We had been looking for a CBD strain for a long time that had any effect. Um, and long story short is not only did he bring it back to life, but he was able to clone it and cut it and uh, to continue to grow it and veg it and, um, and look at the responses and work with Know Your Grow Labs and testing it and figuring out a way to, um, watching it just from one, you know, a couple of percent CBD, I think we got it up to like 18 or 21 percent CBD um, in this first couple of flips and um, moose then, the, the laws in Rhode Island aren't the greatest, uh, they've, they've kind of went backwards a little bit, moose went up to Maine and took this plant with him, and he um, made the interaction. He was he was um, extracting it into a tincture at the time, and he made the relationship oh. with with Susan. So um, it was just canatonic at the time. Um, and the only thing that I asked in the beginning was that I want you to take this plant, I want you to bring it back to life, and the only thing I want to return is spread it like wildfire, and everyone gets it for free. It's everywhere now. And so that's the plan, and that's what we do. Uh, it got named after May, Cindy May. We call it May's Canatonic. And um, there's a whole group for it, actually, on Facebook, where folks, and the only rule is you have to grow it, and you have to keep it in its original form, and whoever gets it gets it for free. You have to share it free. And it's everywhere now. That's wonderful. That's so beautiful. Yeah. So, oh, my goodness. It's, uh, it's just <laughs> another proof that, you know, a group of small, dedicated people can really make change uh, if they believe. Of course. It's powerful. It's the only thing that ever has yeah. changed the world. Sure has. Yeah. Wow. So I get teary-eyed every time I talk about it because I'm like a big sap one, but two because... Um, <laughs> well, it's a moving story. I How think it's symbolic not be, in terms of, yeah, yeah like uh, yeah. cannabis does really bring things back to life and it, it is a, a nature of love, so meant a lot to me to know that you got to have all those sledding experiences and kind of we get frustrated in the cannabis world you know those of us that have been trying to fight to break through the stigmas for a long time and uh just that story alone literally just lit such a fire under me and and put something back in me that I just needed so the to day know that, that I that I published the story that this tiny little dose of maize can of what was then NMLC, this canatonic was stopping these new seizures that had devastated the entire month of January for Cindy May. Uh, the day that I published that, I, I received on that feed um, 
messages from Moose, you know, I was at the end of my rope and this story inspired me to tie another knot and to hold on another day and to keep struggling. Um, and that was only one of, of many messages, but. That's really how we just, felt. And it just, it, it was amazing. We said, well, now we know when we're going in. <laughs> <laughs> truly, truly amazing. And the fact, you know, it's crazy. Seven is my, my favorite number. So that whole point seven. Mm. Point seven. <laughs> how, did you, yeah, how did you come up with point seven? Or you well, you just I double was, point, uh, three, point three, 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 point three, five, five and then you double it. Point seven. Just go low I, and slow. I was just, it was the smallest amount I could measure. It was point zero five mm -hmm. on a one milliliter syringe. It was the smallest amount I could measure and doing the math from however many milligrams it was per milligram per milliliter. Um, that was the yeah. smallest amount that I could effectively measure in the in the syringe. So I was so afraid to give her CBD and, and exasperate her myoclonics. And that's why I tried with such a ridiculous dose that wasn't going to do a thing. Um, <laughs> and it was sure enough, if, if she missed a dose, those seizures came back. And if she, if she took more, her myoclonic seizures, it was a very difficult balancing act. But the important lesson it taught and another lesson that Cindy May left us is that when all else fails with other patients, um, Dr. Sulak has, has taken upon um, microdosing, as, as we call it, um, and trying microdoses of whether it's THCA, THC, or CBD, because some of these patients just don't tolerate or process a large amount of anything, whether it's a typical AD or apparently cannabis. So it's given us another tool in the toolbox and another lesson that sometimes um, if typical dosing of so many milligrams per kilogram don't work, why don't we go back to trying a ridiculously low microdose and a homeopathic type approach? So mm -hmm. it's taught us another lesson. Sometimes less is more, for sure. Right. And um, I think sometimes your story also shows, like, you know, it takes a lot of work sometimes. It's a lot of trial and error. Work. She's become a bad scientist trying to figure <laughs> out, you know, what diet, what this, what that. And, but it works. It works when you apply yourself. You know, a lot of folks are afraid to try it or have one experience with mm -hmm. something that makes them paranoid or I don't want to get the munchies or I don't mm -hmm. want to have a head high. And just knowing that once you start incorporating that whole plant therapy um, and just being willing to have a little bit of trial and error, success and failure, that you will find what works for you. you know, right. It takes a little work, but it's helpful. Yeah. And I think especially treating seizures, um, I think that the other thing that we did for Cindy Mae, which we had already been turned on to improving diet when we moved to the state of Maine, but we went berserk with her diet. The child ate nothing but whole foods. If it didn't come out of out of the ground or um, meat or fish, um, she didn't get it. If it came in a box in the grocery store, she didn't get it. Um, she went on an entirely whole foods diet and she had been gluten free from for years. We had learned the hard way that, that a wheat sandwich was a really bad idea for Cindy Mae, but we um, improved her diet. And I think people miss that these nitrates and these things that are in your typical diet these kids with seizures cannot tolerate so it's almost to the point where I, I refuse to even be involved to help a, a person unless they are willing to fix the child's diet and get out the nitrates get out all those um, toxins and put the child on a whole foods diet because it's critical to seizure control yes, the they can't tolerate blocks. Those dyes can't be good for anyone. No, no, they can't be. A uh, red dye was another trigger. Yeah, um, those dyes terrible. and artificial colors, artificial ingredients, artificial yeah. flavors. Um, she was like, at the hospital, it was a nightmare to feed the child. We had to have, I had friends in, in Rhode Island that would bring me foods from Whole Foods so that I could feed her successfully in the hospital. Um, because even the shakes that they offer, the Pedialyte shakes to put on weight on these children are horrendous yeah. chemical disasters. So it was it was difficult to feed her in the hospital, but I think diet is a, a critical piece and cannabis is just another another supplement to that. And I think people often look to cannabis as a miracle drug and while we see it's a lot of work every day with cannabis, we need to point out that folks need to be willing to have a complete lifestyle change. Mm -hmm. They have to be willing to do the work. Absolutely. It's not like you're just gonna smoke a joint and the whole world gets better. No, it's no. Nope. You have to pay for the joint. You have to, you know, there's a lot that goes on in this yes. process of trying to figure out, you know, holistic healing. So, absolutely. Um, while it will feel like a miracle in the big picture, um, it's really a work in progress, and it's absolutely. just cannabis is just one piece of that that we've seen, you know, success with if incorporated with a whole host of other things. Yep. And Julie, did you have something to add a little? Um, well, as a 
recovering heroin addict a couple years ago, I had a major back surgery. And the doctor, the surgeon, had no problem putting me on Dilaudid and Valium and um, um, Oxycontin for six months. Jeez. And uh, if I would miss a dose, I would get dope sick. And I was like, really? My, where am I going right now? But I was in so much still physical pain that I was dealing with. And um, no one recommended medical cannabis at all to me. And um, not in the medical community anyway. Um, and, and, and I was hanging with one of my friends and, and he suggested, you know, why don't you try some weed? And, and I re reluctantly, because I was, you know, kind of where I was at uh, and my pain was managed well with the opiates. Um, but I knew that I was definitely, my personality was starting to change. I was disengaged in my life. I, you know, like just yeah. my addiction was taking over and I had come so far. And I was like, am I really here right now? So I did, and um, I'd smoke every night, and I started taking less of the opiates and not missing it as much. And if I missed a, a, a dose, I wasn't sick. And I was like, well, something's going on here that's, that's good. And before I knew it, I completely let go of all the opiates and just was using medical cannabis um, for pain management. And uh, awesome. now that my life took off in an awesome way. That's where the microdosing <laughs> you know? comes in far yeah. too often. I mean, I was overprescribed medicine. I've had so many surgeries and right. that another time. But uh, our, op our opioid receptors are so burnt out, right? And it's like more and more and more. And these doctors, we just overprescribe and take more and more, you know, because pain is pain. It's right. real. It's, it's not, we're not faking it. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, this, the endocannabinoid receptors, the receptors that are in your body, um, they haven't been touched a lot of times, so we can treat with minuscule amounts. You know, we have a CB1 and a CB2 receptors, that's where the THC and the CBD attaches to differently, mm -hmm. and so if one doesn't work, try another, and, and right. Kenny made a testament that sometimes it's just it's one a little tweak, and it's a, yeah, little and it's all of a sudden, voila. Yeah. Fabulous. Well, very inspiring. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. So... Thank you. I think um, in closing, we're just going to um, thank everybody for participating and really coming this long way to share your story and Cindy May's story. Mm. Thank you. Yeah, really, we're very grateful. And Julie and Melissa, thank you so much also for taking the time out of your busy life to come and be part of this. So it's hopefully pleasure. we can, hopefully <laughs> you we can help a lot of alone. people. You have been so, through yes. so much. <laughs> yes. And uh, just know that Thank it's you. only just begun this fight. Just so yes. you know. Thank okay. you. Well, we look forward to seeing you at our next episode in a couple of weeks. Thanks for joining us.